Well, my name is Professor Ross McKinnon. Uh, I am the chair of the board of the Pharmaceutical Sciences. I'm from Australia. Uh, and it is my pleasure and, and great honor to moderate the session this evening. Just a few housekeeping announcements before we commence. Um, firstly, the, re the recording of this evening's event, uh, this evening my time, uh, it could be morning or afternoon for you, I acknowledge that we are a global organisation. Uh, the recording will be available on our website, www.events.fip.org. The webinar is being recorded and it's being live streamed via YouTube. As always, you are welcome to provide feedback to webinars at fip.org. And of course, as always, we encourage you to become a member at FIP and of course, through your membership to uh, benefit from uh, many, many um, uh, networking and uh, other opportunities that a global organization such as FIP can provide to you. Today's program. First of all, in introducing the medal, I would acknowledge that the Host Madsen Medal is the highest pharmaceutical science award of FIP, and it is awarded every second year. The award is named after Danish pharmaceutical scientist and former FIP president, Dr. Eric Host Madsen, and is made possible with the support of the Association of Danish Pharmacies, Denmark's Apotheker Borning. For today's program, we will present the award to this year's recipient, Professor Hideyoshi Harashima from Hokkaido University, Japan. And let me at the outset express my uh, extreme pleasure at the awarding of the uh, medal to Professor Harashima, a wonderful recipient, uh, richly deserving of the award, uh, and of course, a great honor. Um, we will learn more about Professor Harashima a little bit later through our president of FIP, uh, Dominique Jordan. But first I would outline the structure of the event that we have uh, uh, developed for this evening. And to just give you an indication of what we are doing this evening, we obviously are honoring Professor Harashima and we will uh, obviously listen to his oration his award uh, presentation with, uh, with great interest. But we thought this was a wonderful opportunity to also expose some of our younger scientists from FIP um, through uh, an event as prestigious as this one, and to also allow Professor Harashima to interact with those younger researchers. So as a result, we will start tonight's presentation with three shorter presentations uh, on the nanomedicine drug delivery theme, which is, of course, uh, the area of Professor Harashima. We have three young researchers from around the world. And after we are finished their presentations, which, which, which will be delivered uh, on video, we will ask Professor Harashima to provide some brief commentary and then uh, ask our younger speakers to respond to that. Following uh, that part of the, uh, the evening, we will then proceed to the presentation of the award. And we're very honored to have the president of FIP, Dominique Jordan, to present the medal and certificate to Professor Harashima. And then of course, Professor Harashima will present his award lecture on multifunctional envelope type nano devices from controlled intracellular trafficking to clinical application for nanomedicines. There is another very important element to tonight's ceremony and that is the opportunity for you to participate uh, in what we're describing essentially as a virtual reception ceremony. Clearly, we would love to have a reception ceremony to celebrate Professor Harashima's honor. That's not possible in the current environment, um, but there will be the opportunity for participants in tonight's event to send their messages and congratulations to Professor Harashima via the chat box in Zoom. And we will collect these, and at the end of his presentation, uh, rather than have a question and answer session, we will actually look at the comments that people have made and also give people the opportunity to provide comments in real time. So as I said, we will begin our event with our three younger speakers. We have three speakers this evening, pictured here. And as you can see, they are certainly young. We have Haley Schultz 
from the University of South Australia in Australia, Associate Professor Yuma Yamada from Hokkaido University, and Yunchin Cindy Zhao, who is from Monash University in Australia. We will begin with the presentation from Haley Schultz from the University of South Australia. Uh, sorry, but prior to that, I just want to obviously highlight our other two uh, key speakers. Um, thank you, Paula, for the next slide. Um, these two uh, photos indicate our two uh, um, obviously most important uh, participants in this evening's event. Our recipient of the Mahosa Madsen Medal, Hideyoshi Har Harashima, uh, Professor of Pharmaceutics, Chair of the Laboratory of Molecular Design and Pharmaceutics at Hokkaido University in Japan. And of course, our FIP president, Dominique Jordan, who will present the award to Hideyoshi a little bit later. Next slide, thanks. So our first speaker for the evening is Dr. Haley Schultz from the University of South Australia, which is based in Adelaide, Australia. Uh, Haley completed her PhD in pharmaceutical science in May 2020 under the supervision of Professor Clive Prestige at the University of South Australia. During her PhD, Haley developed a novel formulation method for improving the absorption of drugs with oral delivery and absorption challenges using supersaturation lipids and nanoporous silica microparticles. Her broad experimental methods range from physicochemical characterization through to preclinical animal trials. Notably, she was successful in applying her novel formulation method to abiraterone acetate, a first line prostate cancer drug with poor absorption and issues around patient compliance. Haley improved the absorption of this important drug by 40%, which is expected to allow patients to take smaller daily doses and to take those doses independently of food, which of course, as we all know, improves patient compliance and quality of life. She is now working as a postdoctoral researcher in the area of pharmacokinetics, where she was integrating knowledge acquired during her PhD with novel pharmacokinetic analysis methods to address broader issues with respect to the quality use of medicines. As a result of this integration, Haley was recently successful in securing a significant hospital research foundation grant here in Australia for prostate cancer to apply her pharmacokinetic analysis and modeling skills to the performance of her formulations developed during her PhD to more complex preclinical model, models with great opportunities for future human clinical translation. The title of her presentation is Supersaturated Silica Lipid Hybrid Formulations, Improving the Oral Bioavailability of Abiraterone Acetate. Thank you, Haley. Hello everyone, my name is Haley Schultz and I'm an early career researcher from the University of South Australia. I completed my PhD last year under the supervision of Professor Clive Prestige and during that time I developed a new and improved oral lipid-based formulation for the prostate cancer drug called abiraterone acetate. So today I'll be presenting to you how we went about this and why and then delve into the mechanisms behind these formulations to understand how they can improve the oral delivery of abiraterone to ultimately improve prostate cancer patient outcomes. Abiraterone acetate, commercialized under the brand name Zytiga, was first marketed in 2011. It is indicated for the treatment of metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer and is a first-in-class drug. It slows the uh, it slows the prostate cancer growth through inhibiting androgen synthesis, such as testosterone. It gained blockbuster status in the financial year of 2011 to 2012, when it surpassed one billion US dollars in sales. However, despite its, its success, the formulation is actually not very efficient and is difficult to take by patients. Firstly, patients must take a large 1,000 milligram dose in the form of two 500 milligram tablets or four 250 milligram tablets. However, the oral bioavailability of the formulation is less than 10%. This means that of that 1,000 milligram dose, only a maximum of 100 milligrams is absorbed. For the rest, 900 milligrams moving through the gastrointestinal tract and being excreted by the feces. This occurs as abiraterone acetate is very poorly water soluble. When the tablets are swallowed, they enter the gut where poor solubilization occurs. 
allowing only a small amount of drug to be absorbed across the gut wall, while the rest sits in the gut and causes diarrhea before it is excreted. On top of the large inefficient dose, patients must also take abiraterone in the fasted state. So the patient must refrain from eating for two hours before and one hour after taking their medication. This is because the drug exhibits a huge and extremely variable pharmaceutical food effect. This is the abiraterone plasma concentration time curve in the fast state. The medication must be taken in the fast state as if the patient were to take a low fat meal or a high fat meal with the medication, exposure of the drug increases, increases five to tenfold, risking toxic effects, including cardiotoxicity. We see a food effect due to the high log P of abiraterone, meaning it has a tendency to solubilize more in fatty and oily environments such as food than aqueous environments such as the fasted stomach. So patients are currently taking large, inefficient doses in the fasted state that causes diarrhea, which leads to poor patient compliance and poor patient outcomes. There is a lot of room for improvement here for a new oral abiraterone formulation. Last year, we published a review article looking at all the oral formulation strategies that have been applied to abiraterone to overcome these issues and found that there had only been four published attempts, each with pros and cons. But what stood out for us was that there had not yet been a published article where a lipid-based formulation had been applied to abiraterone. With lipid-based formulations being our research group's specialty, and the knowledge that abiraterone is very lipid soluble, we set out to apply a lipid-based formulation approach to abiraterone. But what is a lipid-based formulation? Lipid-based formulations essentially mimic the food effect. We pre-dissolve the drug in the liquid lipid, which is simply oil, and when our formulation is ingested, the lipid is digested by lipases, just as fats and oil are in our food, which helps the drug release from the formulation and keeps it in a solubilized state for fast and efficient drug absorption. By doing this, we essentially remove the food effect as the drug's absorption is maximized, meaning that the patient can choose to consume food with the medication if they prefer. There are a whole range of different lipid-based formulations such as solar lipid nanoparticles, emulsions, uh, self-emulsifying drug delivery systems, and liposomes. However, Oh, that's the solubilization of the drug in the lipid. However, however, we decided to use the supersaturated silica lipid hybrid approach, super SLH for short. This is a formulation I established in the first couple of years of my PhD and combines the benefits of solid state stab stability and high drug loading. Through the solidification and supersaturation of the typical lipid based formulation, and it was found to be very effective for the drug ibuprofen. Super SLH are fabricated by adding excess drug to a lipid, heating it to 60 degrees to dissolve the drug, and then mixing it with porous silica uh, microparticles at a one-to-one -one ratio to form supersaturated silica lipid hybrid microparticles upon cooling. The pores and the surface of the silica stabilize the supersaturated drug and maintain it in a solubilized or amorphous state. That is an important factor for improving oral drug delivery. Therefore, our aims of this project were to one, reformulate abiraterone acetate using a super SLH approach to ultimately reduce the dose, improve oral bioavailability and remove the need for fasting. And two, to understand how super SLH improves the oral drug delivery of abiraterone. This is a list of the super SLH formulations that were investigated and the controls we compared them against. We prepared Super SLH using two different lipids, Catmull PGA and Catmull MCM. And we also invested four different drug saturation levels, 90%, which is not super saturated, and 150, 200, and 250%, which are above 100% of the equilibrium solubility, so are super saturated. The controls were Zytega, which is the commercial formulation, and pure crystalline unformulated abiraterone acetate. We performed scanning electron microscopy on the silica microparticles and the super SLH formulations, and we saw that they looked no different from each other, suggesting that the lipid and the drug were successfully loaded within the lipid, within the silica, sorry. 
We also perform X-ray powder diffraction on the formulations to see if any of the amorphous drug had recrystallized. We know that the super SLH with drug loads of 90% and 150% contain no crystalline drug, the two red lines here, um, as, diffract, uh, as crystalline diffraction patterns are absent from their diffractive grams. Whereas at the higher drug loads of 200 and 250%, there was some crystallized drug present. As you can see, small crystalline diffraction patterns in the diffractograms. Now we moved on to in vitro solubilization testing of the formulations to compare the drug release over 60 minutes. Pure crystalline drug in black exhibits very poor dissolution due to its crystallinity. Zartiga in gray has improved dissolution due to containing micronized crystalline drug and surfactants, and all of my super SLH formulations at the top here, prepared with a Catmull PG8 lipid, has superior drug dissolution, owing to containing amorphous drug. And there was not a lot of difference between the formulations. On the other hand, interestingly, the super SLH prepared with a Catmull MCM did not perform any better than the Zytega. And the reason for this is explained in our later studies. However, this is a simple study and it's not very bioreligant to what occurs in our gut. So we moved on to in vitro solubilization during lipolysis studies, where we used fasted state simulated intestinal, intestinal media and added pancreatic lipase to the vessel to initiate lipid digestion. So we expected greater drug release from our super SLH due to, due to the lipase being present. For super SLH prepared with a Catmull PGH, we saw a very similar trend, um, a similar trend within the super SLH formulations, with the lower drug loaded formulation, formulations performing better than the higher drug loaded formulations. And for super SLH with Catmull MCM, the super SLH formulations were now performing better than Zytiga highlighting that for these formulations, digestion is much more important for their drug release. During these studies, we also monitored the degree of digestion that occurred by measuring free fatty acid release. All formulations had a one-to-one -one ratio of lipid to silica. However, due to the different drug loads the, and the formulations being dosed at three milligrams of abiraterone, there was more lipid present in the vessel for formulations with the lower drug loads. And this translated into more digestion as expected. This was also the same for the Catmull MCM. At this point, I was understanding most of the trends I was seeing with the formulations, but I wasn't quite sure why the SLH with a 90% drug loading was performing so much better than all the other formulations. Both the 90 and the 150% were amorphous. So why wasn't the 150% formulation performing as good as the 90% formulation? Or maybe it was due to the amount of lipid present in the administered formulation um, where most of the lipid was present in the 90% formulation, leading to better solubilization through the production of my cells. So I decided to test this. I co-dose the super SLH with the 250% drug load with extra free lipid to make it equivalent to the SLH90 formulation. And here is the profile in the middle here. Having extra lipid improved the solubilization somewhat, but not to the same extent as SLH90. This concluded that it was a combination of crystallinity and the amount of lipid dosed, leading to solubilization performance. We also conducted confocal microscopy on fluorescently labelled formulations to look at where the lipid was loaded in comparison to the silica. And what we saw was very interesting. The Catmull PGH was not penetrating the pores and was sitting on the outside of the silica particles, whereas the Catmull MCM was homogeneously dispersed throughout the porous silica and was also between the particles. After digestion, the majority of the Catmull PG8 lipid uh, in these images um, is released with the drug, leading to the superior performance that we've seen in the in vitro studies, compared to a lot of the Catmull MCM lipid and, presum and presumably drug 
being retained within the porous silica after digestion. Back to solubilization studies, we also compared the solubilization of Zytiga to our leading SLH formulation in both the fasted and fed states to predict the pharmaceutical food effect. And as you can see, there is a 300% food effect with Zytiga, which is consistent with what we see in humans, and a very minimal effect for our leading formulation. If this is translated in vivo, this would mean that our new formulation could be taken at either the fed or fasted state. Our final study was an in vivo pharmacokinetic study where we administered the formulations as a suspension by oral garbage to fasted sprawled dooley rats and took blood samples over eight hours. And we saw some pleasing results with our leading formulation exhibiting a 43% increase in oral bioavailability compared to the commercial product Zytiga. The other formulations followed a similar trend to what we saw in vitro, except Zytiga performed a little better than what we expected. However, there are limitations to using rats as they do not have a gallbladder and they secrete bile continuously. So all formulations investigated in this study benefited from the solubilizing properties of bile. When this formulation is given to pigs or humans, we expect the lipid-based formulations to stimulate the excretion of bile due to the presence of the lipid, like food, and Zytiga not to. So there would be potentially a greater improvement in oral bioavailability by the SLH formulations compared to Zytiga. Furthermore, if the 43% uh, increase in oral bioavailability is translated to humans, we could also decrease the abiraterone dose from 1,000 milligrams to 700 milligrams, which would improve prostate cancer patients' diarrhea. To summarise, during my PhD, I was able to develop a successful and novel lipid-based formulation for abiraterone acetate and was able to understand its mechanisms of drug release during digestion. I had built a solid foundation of evidence to support the further investigation of the performance of super-SLH in more complex in vivo models to progress the formulation towards clinical translation. Currently, I am working with Dr. Stephanie Rotolangi as a postdoctoral researcher, where I've developed an entirely new set of skills in population pharmacokinetic modelling, and I've identified where my newfound skills can complement my PhD work. So I collaborated with my PhD supervisor here, Professor Clive Prestige, and we were successful in the award of a $148,000 grant from the Hospital Research Foundation, who are going to support, who is going who are going to support us in taking these formulations into pigs, as their gut is a much better representation of a human than a rat. We'll be able to conduct fed versus fasted, fasted state studies too uh, to see if the reduced food effects translate in vivo. And I'll also be able to apply my new skills and conduct some interspecies pharmacokinetic modelling using the rat and pig data to extrapolate the pharmacokinetics we'd expect in humans. Thank you so very much, FIP, for granting me this opportunity to speak as part of the host Madsen uh, Medal Ceremony. It is a great honour and a huge congratulations to, prof to Professor Harashima. The research you have conducted over your career is amazing and so impactful, and you are a very worthy recipient of this award. Well done. And finally, Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Hayley. Um, really exciting work with clear translational potential and, and uh, fascinating to see how you're transitioning into a uh, slightly more sort of clinical uh, aspect of the work, but complementing the work that you did in your PhD. So congratulations on your work and congratulations on your presentation. Um, our second presenter tonight is Associate Professor Yuma Yamada from Hokkaido University. Uh, Associate Professor Yamada is, uh, of course, located in Professor Hiroshima's lab in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Hokkaido University. He's also a pharmacist in the Department of Pharmacy at Hokkaido University Hospital. He received his BS, MS and PhD degrees from Hokkaido University in 2003 2005 and 2008 respectively. After serving as an instructor 
uh, in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Hokkaido University in 2007. He was promoted to the rank of Assistant Professor in 2009. He was also a pharmacist in the Disaster Medical Assistance Team from Hokkaido University Hospital for the Great East Je Japanese Earthquake in 2011. He was promoted to the rank of Associate Professor in 2016. He also became a Scientific Advisor for Luca Science Inc. in 2019 and Principal Investigator in Hokkaido University's Industry Creation Laboratories and Forest uh, Program Researcher, uh, JST Japan in 2021. He has won a number of awards for his research. He won the Nina Farm Award in 2011, the Pharmaceutical Society of Japan Award for Young Scientists in 2014, the Academy of Pharmaceutical Science and Technology uh, Japan Award for Young Scientists in 2014 also, and Young Researchers Award of the Japan Society of Drug Delivery Systems, uh, DDS in 2015. He certainly has a full mantelpiece. He has been an outstanding reviewer for the Journal of Controlled Release from 2013, and his main research interest is in the development of mitochondrial drug delivery systems, nanoparticle packaging for various cargoes, such as protein, nucleic acids, etc., gene and cell therapy, and also nano design of pharmaceutics for organelle targeting. The title of his presentation tonight, uh, or this evening, or morning, afternoon, wherever you may be, uh, is the way to develop an innovative nanomedicine targeting mitochondria. Thank you, uh, Associate Professor Yamada. I'm Yuma Yamada, Associate Professor of Hokkaido University. I'm honored to present some of our recent findings here. And I'd like to thank the member of the FYP Organic Committee for this opportunity. Congratulations to Professor Hanashima on the Houston Madison Medal Award. I'd like to extend my heartfelt congratulations. I started my research in 2002 in Professor Hanashima's lab. Since then, I have been very grateful for his guidance and encouragement of my research on drug delivery system, DDS, for the past 20 years. This slide shows the schema of my first research topic, which was pro uh, presented by Professor Harashima when I was undergraduate student. The ultimate goal was to develop a mitochondrial targeting DDS for innovative nanomedicines. I'd like to thank Professor Hanashima and all the members of his lab for his giving me this opportunity to be involved in this interesting research. Today, I'd like to present some of our recent findings entitled The Way to Develop an Innovative Nanomedicine Targeting Mitochondria. Why is it important to target mitochondria rather than the nucleus, the cytosol, or other organelles? This slide provides some reasons. As you well know, mitochondria carry out various essential functions, including ATP production, regulating apoptosis, and they also have their own genome, mitochondrial DNA. In recent years, mitochondrial dysfunctions have been implicated as being involved in a number of diseases. Therefore, the answer to the previous question is because mitochondria represent a promising organella in various fields, including the life sciences, drug discovery, and gene therapy. To achieve such an innovative mitochondrial therapy, a mitochondrial DDS will be needed. In 2002, I started my research on developing a mitochondrial DDS. At that time, there were only a few reports regarding such delivery systems. Since then, a number of mitochondrial DDS have been reported and we have continued to carry out research directed toward achieving successful mitochondrial delivery.
This slide shows schematic images of mitochondrial delivery by the mitopora, which is a liposomal mitochondrial DDS that was developed in our laboratory. The mitopora is modified with octal algae, also known as R8, a cell penetrating peptide, and is first internalized into the cytosol via macropinocytosis. The mitopora binds to mitochondria via electrostatic interaction. Finally, the cargoes are delivered into mitochondria via membrane fusion strategy. This membrane fusion mechanism-based strategy permits the cargo to be delivered to mitochondria, independent of its size and physical chemical properties. As shown in this video, mitochondria actively repeat fusion and fission to share biomacromolecules in living cells. Therefore, we expected that the use of a membrane fusion strategy using a mitopolar system will permit a macromolecule to be delivered to mitochondria. We successfully identified lipsome with a high mitochondrial fusionogenic activity among more than 100 types, and we refer to these as mitopolars. Intracellular observation showed that the green fluorescent labeled mitopora was co-localized uh, with red stained mitochondria and that they appeared as yellow signals. These results confirm that the mitopora can reach the mitochondria of living cells. This slide summarizes aspects of our research and the development of mitochondrial nanomedicines regarding cell therapy, the treatment of cancer and ischemic disease, as well as mitochondrial gene therapy. The focus of this presentation is on validation of mitochondrial gene therapeutic strategy by the mitochondrial delivery of therapeutic RNAs. As a first attempt to validate mitochondrial RNA therapy targeting disease cells, we verified nucleic acid delivery therapy using cells of patients with mitochondrial diseases with Z625A heteroplasmic mutation in the tRNA penin RNA and uh, coded in the mitochondrial DNA. Before starting this research, which was done in collaboration with Hokkaido University Hospital and Sapporo City General Hospital, we obtained approval from independent clinical research study for establishment of drug treatment for mitochondrial diseases. As a therapeutic strategy for targeting mutated mitochondria, we attempted to deliver wild-type mitochondrial pre-TRNA using mitopora in order to decrease the mutation rate of TRNA in mitochondria. In this experiment, we prepared the tRNA mitopora in the following way. Condensed particles of tRNA were prepared by mixing a solution of tRNA and protamine. The condensed particles were packaged in mitochondrial fusionogenic envelopes to produce tRNA mitopora. Using the ethanol dilution method, the prepared carriers were positively charged and had a diameter of uh, 160 nanometer. This slide shows the result for the mutation rate of tRNA feeding alanine intracellular mitochondria after transfection by the mitopora. As shown in this graph, we confirmed that mutation rate of tRNA decreased in the case of wild type uh, tRNA whereas the transfection of control sequence had no uh, effect on the mutation rate. This therapeutic effect was sustained even on ACE post-transfection.
Furthermore, we investigated the influence on mitochondrial respiratory activity associated with decrease on rate of mutation. We discovered that the activity of the disease cells increased after mitochondrial transfection, therapeutic tRNA. In normal cell, however, mitochondrial activity did not change. We also used this mitopolar system to deliver therapeutic messenger RNA to mitochondria in disease cells. In this experiment, we verified that the therapeutic strategy using LSND3 cells of mitochondrial re syndrome patient with uh, RT10158C mutation in the uh, ND3 messenger RNA coded in mitochondrial DNA. In this study, we attempted to deliver therapeutic messenger RNA coding the normal ND3 protein using a mitopora in order to decrease the mutation rate of messenger RNA D3 in mitochondria. Following a series of investigations, we successfully delivered therapeutic messenger RNA into the mitochondria of the disease cells, decreasing the mutation a mutant messenger RNA D3 content. Let Carabat indicate the mitochondrial treatment. Furthermore, we confirm that the rate of mitochondrial respiratory activity increased after mitochondrial transfection with messenger RNA mitopora. Furthermore, we validated mitochondrial delivery of therapeutic ribosomal RNA in disease cells. We added mitopolar encapsulating therapeutic ribosomal RNA to the disease cell with mutated ribosomal RNA and measured the target RNA mutation rate. As a result, a significant decrease in mutation rate was observed. We also observed an increase in mitochondrial respiratory activity and the RNA mitopolar treatment group. The present study demonstrates that mitopolar strategy can be useful for the delivery of all type of uh, RNA encoded by mitochondrial DNA, tRNA, messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA. We are currently conducting clinical research directed toward trials to establish a viable mitochondrial gene therapeutic strategy. Our ultimate goal is to carry out successful mitochondrial therapy using a mitochondrial DDS. To reach our projected goal, we are participating in the drug discovery project, the Seven Seas Project, the aim of which to conduct research and develop leading to the treatment of mitochondrial diseases and to promote research aimed at contributing to medical care, the economy, and society. Based on the mitochondrial system, BioVenture Luca Science Inc. was established on December 25 of 2018, and from April 2019, Professor Harashima and I have become scientific advisors. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Associate Professor Yamada, and obviously, once again, clear translational impact and, and a highly topical area. Uh, our third speaker uh, for our younger scientists' presentations is Yunshin Cindy Shao, who is from Monash University in Australia. Cindy is a final year PhD candidate under the supervision of Professor Ben Boyd at the Monash Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences at Monash University in Melbourne. 
Her research interest is in engineering lipid and polymer colloids of various geometry to achieve a controlled release mechanism of high drug payload carriers. Her research is funded by the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence in Convergent Bio Nanoscience and Technology, along with Monash University scholarships. She was also awarded a top up scholarship from the Australian Institute of Nuclear Science and Engineering to use the scattering facilities at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. She was awarded the Overseas Travel Fellowship from the Australian Nanotechnology Network, uh, the ANC International Travel Scholarship, that is called, and the Honourable Geoffrey Conard AM Student Travelling Scholarship to visit the Institute of Chemical Engineering and Sciences in Singapore with Dr Alexander Jackson. She also collaborates with Professor Dan Peer in Tel Aviv University in Israel with the 3D Cancer Spheroid Model sponsored by the Australian Friends of Tel, Tel Aviv University. Uh, Monash University. She's presented her research in multiple domestic and international conferences, where she was awarded oral and poster presentation awards multiple times. The most impactful of these was first place in the Young Scientist Vision Contest at the Controlled Release Society annual meeting in 2020, which allowed her to publish her research uh, in the CRS newsletter. Her work has significance in drug delivery, colloid science and polymer science, and she is skillful in a wide range of techniques for the structural analysis of nanoparticles, including cryo, transmission, electron microscopy, neutron scattering, and X-ray scattering. She has experience in culturing cancer cells in both 2D monolayers and spheroids and imaging them with confocal microscopy and total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. Her presentation tonight uh, is called Drug in a Shell, investigation of new approaches to the preparation of elongated drug-loaded nanocapsules. Thank you, Cindy. Hello, everyone. My name is Cindy from Monash University in Australia. I'm towards the end of my PhD journey in Professor Ben Boy's group. It's my great pleasure to share my PhD project with all of you, and I hope you all enjoyed it. In my PhD, I'm working on putting drug in a shell. The shell is a type of polymeric nanocapsules, and I investigated new approaches to use them to prepare elongated drug-loaded nanocapsules. There are a few different elements in this project. To start with, I picked an elongated shape instead of a spherical shape as the target. The inspiration comes from some studies in the literature on delivery of polymeric nanoparticles of different shapes such as this example of delivering polystyrene nanoparticles. When they are delivered in an elliptical shape, the efficiency of uptake by macrophages um, were much slower than when they were delivered as spherical nanocapsules, nanoparticles, which means that if drugs can be loaded in non-spherical nanocapsules, they can be used as non-circulating drug delivery system. As a result, the pre-systematic excretion by macrophages and the immune system will be minimized before they reach the target site. The second part is the choice of the form of drug. I chose to encapsulate a drug nanocrystal over drug in solution so that I'm able to increase the drug payload per dose. And as a result, patients will be able to take the formula much less frequently. What's even better about this drug nanocrystal is that it is able to elongate the liposome, which is then used as a template to, for the synthesis of nanocapsules. So the two benefits are combined. I encapsulated the drug nanocrystals to increase the drug payload and the liposome templates are elongated. So in this project, I grow a layer of raft cross-linked polymer on the surface of this elongated liposome template to give extra protection for the drug against the complex environment in the body and to achieve a sustained release profile. Due to the rigidity and inelasticity of the polymer, it is hypothesized that it is able to keep the elongated shape to be used as a long circulating drug delivery system. The method I use is called vesicle templating. This method was initially used to prepare hollow spherical um, nanocapsules in the literature. So on the left-hand side is the cryo-TM images of 
um, the DODAP vesicles. And on the right hand side is the four um, spherical nanocapsules. So what they did was they used the positively charge on the surface of the vesicles and then grow a layer of polymer on the surface. The novelty of my project instead is that instead of the spherical shape, I made it elongated. Also, I'm able to load the drug in there. So instead of leaving it as hollow, um, it can be used as a drug delivery carrier. Once this method is validated, we will be able to extend this application to the industrial field, such as making sleeveless latex gloves or load some other chemicals to be used as personal care products or agricultural chemistry. So first of all, how can we obtain the elongated liposome templates? I use thin film hydration to make the lipid film and then I did sonication and extrusion to decrease the size and polydispersity of the liposomes. And then buffer exchange was used to bring the pH of the external solution to pH seven. Um, and then the pH gradient is set up for active loading. This ciprofloxacin drug was then used as the model drug and 95% of encapsulation was achieved. To obtain the drug nanocrystal, which is the most important thing, um, the encapsulated liposomes were frozen in liquid nitrogen and then thawed in room temperature. With the formations of ice crystals inside the liposome acting as a nuclei, ciprofloxacin crystallized, elongated the liposomes without breaking the lipid bilayer. The formations of drug nanocrystals inside liposomes were confirmed by crowd TEM and wide angle X-ray scattering. From the um, diffraction profile, it was clear that only after free thawing, um, ciprofloxacin appeared as an order crystalline form compared to before free thawing and empty liposomes. So in this case, Azide functionalized liposomes were also prepared, and it can be shown that the surface functionality did not affect the formations of the nanocrystals, which provided us with an additional route for the next step of making the nanocapsules. So now we've got some liposome templates and ready to make some nanocapsules. First of all, we would like to investigate the driving force to attract the polymer to the surface of the liposome templates. Therefore, three types of liposomes were made with different surface properties and functionalizations. This might also lead to the formations of nanocapsules down the track with various shell thickness and rigidity. So the first one is the basic liposome model with H, SPC, and cholesterol as the main component for the membrane. The second one is functionalized by a clique chemistry group, the Azide group, which was mentioned in the previous slide, um, which allows covalent coupling with polymers um, with the complementary alkyne groups. In the third one, some positively charged surfactant was added in the formulation mimicking the previous example where hollow spherical nanocapsules were formed with the use of pure DODAP um, vesicles. And in this case, the absorption step was driven by electrostatic interactions. On the other side of the project, our collaborator in Singapore synthesized this rough uh, short chain oligomer, basically um, about like nine to 15 monomer units by using acrylic acrylic acid and butyl acrylate. Once we've got both of them, liposome templates were added to the oligomer solution. The reason that I do this absorption step instead of directly doing polymerization was to ensure that the rough oligomer was actually on the surface of the template. Um, by doing this, it drives the polymerization reaction on the surface. If a direct polymerization was performed, it might happen in the solution, in the lipid bilayer, or even in the aqueous course of the template, which is not what we want. So the shell, after that, the shell of the polymer was formed by polymerization reaction, 
and the resultant morphology was investigated and optimized by using different monomer addition method or with or without the crosslinker EGDA and with different types of um, initiator at different reaction temperature. So due to time constraint, only a small part of the results are presented for the purposes of um, delivering the ideas. So firstly, we found that the membranes were actually thicker after uh, absorption, indicating that it is possible that um, to absorb this rough oligomer on the liposome template. And then I took some elongated liposomes with struck nanocrystals um, for absorption. The rough oligomers again was successfully absorbed without destroying the colloidal stability of the system. Thanks to the design of the oligomer, having a balance between hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity. What was even better was that the drop nanocrystals were still intact after the absorption and the elongated shape was maintained. So now I'm confident to take those absorbed particles to perform some polymerizations. I use two methods of adding the monomers. One is swelling. Um, many all monomers were added um, all at once at the reaction flask. The second one was feeding, which means that they were added with the syringe driver at a certain speed, like drop by drop. What that does is to give different polymerization rate and would change the rigidity of the polymer and the morphology of the nanocapsules. So with the result, we found that different geometry was actually observed and um, successfully form some elongated nanocapsules, especially with the swelling with EGDA as the crosslinker. Um, as shown in these cryo-TM images, and some interesting interparticular connections was also observed when no EGDA was used with the swelling method, um, which will be investigated um, further later. However, the purity and consistency of the elongated nanocapsule still need to be improved by um, using either electrostatic interactions or click chemistry coupling, as briefly introduced before. In the preparation process, some basic characterization techniques were used to monitor direction, including dynamic light scattering and um, gas chromatography mass spectroscopy, GCMS. So zeta potential graphs showed us that um, the attachment of the negatively charged oligomer due to the presence of carboxylic acid enhanced the negatively ch negative charge on the surface of the temper after absorption and polymerization. GCMS showed that in all conditions of the reaction, the raw reagent, the methyl, the monomer methyl acrylate has been consumed. So up to this point, you might have the question about if the polymeric layer was actually on the surface. I have taken a few approaches and attempts to try to prove it. So first of all, I try to measure it from, measure the thickness of the shell from the CrowTM micrographs. However, due to the resolution of the technique, I was not able to um, actually tell the difference. And secondly, I used Trident um, which breaks the lipid bilayer, but it won't be able to break the um, cross-linked polymeric nanocapsules. I try to break it and then image it. Um, however, we can roughly see that there is a less population after we break um, the liposomes. However, it's still not a definite conclusion. So we use small angle neutron scattering and contrast match method um, to try to prove it. The idea comes from the benefits of contrast match experiments and neutron scattering to observe different components of the same system relatively independently. So the idea is we use deuterated HSPC to make the lipid bilayer and um, the polymer layer is as usual, which means that if we use different concentrations of D2O and H2O as the solvent, we will be able to match up one part of the components and they will appear differently under neutron beam. 
So by doing this, um, by doing all of the different conditions, we were able to model the intersection between the particles from small angle neutron scattering. So as usual, the investigations of one research question might lead to the realizations of 10 more questions. So below is a selection of other explorations that I used um, in this project. And some of them are still unsolved, but I just want to take this opportunity to share those ideas and one day they might get reserved. So I have attempted to use um, VA44, which is the lower temperature initiator, to try to keep the drug in there, but it was unsuccessful. Um, and in the future, we might be able to use like redox reactions, like polymerization reactions, just so that it can happen in like, for example, room temperatures. And the other thing is I try to modify the size of the drug nanocrystals to change the aspect ratio of the nanocapsules. And I have tried to mod modify the concentrations, concentrations of the cholesterol, but um, apparently the lipid bilayer is um, more fragile to break if we don't add cholesterols. And the other ones is, as I mentioned before, um, I inserted some of the dough that in my lipid bilayer. Um, however, due to the um, hydrophobicity of dough that, a low concentrations of so stability is actually required. So in this case, um, I think the dough depth vesicles and the lipid bilayer actually separated instead of getting integrated in one particles. And last but not least, um, because we are able to use azi functionalized liposomes to click to small molecule dye. So we have the questions about if we can actually click it to rather legumer and use that as the driving force. And this is what I'm at the moment optimizing. So to conclude, elongated liposomes were used as novel template to prepare elongated polymeric nanocapsules. Various mechanisms of absorption was explored and it was successful to keep the drug nanocrystal as well as to maintain the elongated shape. And polymerizations need to be further investigated to optimize the purity of the elongated nanocapsules. I would like to thank everyone, including I, our research group, sponsors, collaborators, for all of the amazing support throughout my PhD. And I would like to thank Ross for giving me this opportunity to share all those with you. I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. An amazing amount of work uh, for a PhD candidate. Uh, highly innovative, and uh, and obviously a lot of, uh, of uh, future research to evolve from what you've already done. It's now my great pleasure to invite Pro Professor Harashima um, to uh, provide some brief comments on the three presentations from the younger researchers that we've seen tonight. Professor Harashima. Okay. okay thank you. So first, uh, hi, uh, Haley. Uh, thank you for your interesting study on supersaturated silica lipid hybrid formulation. You succeeded in enhancing oral bioavailability significantly. And there was very interesting results, which were opposite to my expectation. So let me ask two questions. First one. As to SLH, uh, silica lipid hybrid, did you examine the in vitro solubilization study, not only for P90, but also surrounding points such as P70, P50, or P100? Thank you, Professor Hiroshima. Um, no, we did not measure uh, the solubilization at, the, at those other levels. Um, we wanted to focus on a drug level that was below the supersaturation level and also some higher supersaturation levels. But of course, it would be very interesting to look at those other levels and to um, gain more data points to understand that trend better. I see. So P90 may not be the optim optimum value. 
yeah, that's right. We could um, investigate that further to I further think. optimize the formulation. Okay, thank you. My second question is, uh, uh, what do you think is the underlying mechanism of this uh, uh, very interesting result? Why uh, non-supersaturated SLH was better than supersaturated? That's a good question. Um, my previous work showed that supersaturated silica lipid hybrids um, were actually better than non-supersaturated for the drug ibuprofen. That's the drug that I used for my simple initial studies. Um, when I moved to the prostate cancer drug, abiraterone, we saw the opposite effect, which was very interesting. So it's definitely a drug dependent um, um, result. So um, we think the underlying mechanism here for this drug in particular is that we need to deliver the drug in that solubilized state uh, in the lipid so we can maintain drug solubilization in the gut and avoid any recrystallization in the gut. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I hope uh, your success in clinical translation. Thank you. Thank you. So, <clears throat> uh, hi, Yuma. Uh, so, 20 years ago, little attention was paid to mitochondrial delivery. However, its importance has been recognized by many researchers in different fields now. So your time has come. Mitoporta is a non-viral carrier system based on membrane fusion mechanism. So my question is, first question is, is there any difference in the fusion mechanism between nuclear delivery and mitochondrial delivery? Uh, thank you very much, Professor Harashima for kind and impressive comment. And uh, thank you very much for an important uh, question. Uh, we screened uh, mitochondrial fusionic uh, ribosome using isolated mitochondria among uh, more than 100 types of ribosome by varying the repeat compositions. First, we identified about 10 types of ribosomes uh, with mitochondrial fusionic activity. And uh, we also check the fusionic activity of these ribosomes with nuclear membrane and uh, cellular membranes. As a result, we also uh, found that some of the ribosomes uh, fuse with nuclear and uh, cellular membranes. Uh, finally, we uh, determined that two, only two kinds of ribosomes uh, as a mitoporters. Mitoporters uh, fuse uh, only mitochondrial membrane, not fuse nuclear and uh, cellular membranes. Unfortunately, the detailed mechanism uh, of uh, membrane fusion is not uh, yet clear. Uh, I believe that this is an issue for a future study. Is answer good enough? <laughs> okay, thank you very much. But very interesting to see your future result. Thank you. So thank my you. second question is, Please give us your comments on the possibility and impact of mitochondrial therapy in near future. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about the potential of mitochondrial therapy. Mm -hmm. I believe that the mitochondrial delivery of molecules as drugs can achieve various kinds of therapeutic strategy, including cancer therapy and ischemic disease therapy, uh, of course, uh, gene therapy. I'm especially excited about mitochondrial gene therapy. Current treatment uh, for mitochondrial genomic diseases are mainly sympathetic therapy involving the continuous administration of vitamins to uh, support mitochondrial function. This conventional uh, therapy cannot treat mitochondrial genetic uh, deficiency Mitochondrial gene therapy by mitochondrial delivery of nucleic acid can treat mitochondrial genomic uh, deficiency and be as uh, 
an alternative to current treatment. And uh, I hope that uh, mitochondrial gene medicine will be developed uh, like a messenger RNA vaccine in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, perspective. Very uh, exciting. Thank you very much. Thank you. So finally, uh, hi, hi, Cindy. Uh, thank you for your very challenging study regarding elongated drug-loaded nanocapsule. The effect of shape of nanocarrier is a very interesting aspect to be studied. However, we have not studied this point uh, intensively so far. Therefore, I think your approach is very original and stimulating. So let me ask two questions. First one, you succeed in making elongated liposomes with rod-shaped drug nanocrystal inside. I am interested in how this shape of nanocrystal was formed. What is the driving force? Is the shape dependent on the drug you use? Um, yes, so it depends on the drug that I use because um, when the drug forms the nanocrystals inside the liposome, and that's why we need a liposome which is soft so that when the drug crystallizes, it stretches the membrane. Um, so the initial intention for the study is to encapsulate um, so cytotoxic drugs for cancer therapy. So a lot of cancer drugs, actually even without the free thawing process, they crystallize inside the liposomes. Um, yeah. So. Okay, thank you. My second question, uh, I am also interested in how the shape of nanoparticles influence the affinity of surface ligand between spherical shape and elongated shape. Um, thank you for your question. So, um, so it's about the affinity between the elongated shape and the actual ligand on the cells, right? Yeah, so um, from my understanding, I think we are um, more, we have a bit more knowledge in terms of um, the size and the shape and how they come into contact um, with macrophages. So um, mm -hmm. the mechanism is uh, majorly about like the engulf of the macrophages of the particles. So there is not as much as um, ligands associated with it, but that's definitely another um, very interesting aspect in terms of um, ligand clicking. So I think in the future, um, because of the use of the polymer um, and when we synthesize the polymer, it's very easy to um, make or like functionalize or like put a specific ligand or a functional group on the side chain of the polymer. And that's why this method, uh, once it's been validated, it can be mm -hmm. very versatile in terms of um, clicking to specific ligands. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you for all Thank three you for your uh, presenters. Very, in very impressive. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, let me reiterate the thank you to our three uh, young researchers, three dynamic presentations and, uh, and a rare opportunity to interact with, uh, with someone of the calibre of Professor Hiroshima uh, in this type of forum. Um, and thank you, Professor Hiroshima, for, um, for processing those uh, presentations and providing some, uh, some insightful and stimulating questions. Uh, it's now time for the formal part of the proceedings this evening, uh, the most exciting part of the evening, of course, which is the presentation of the uh, host Madsen Medal to Professor Hiroshima. Uh, and it's my great honour to invite uh, the president of FIP, Dominique Chaudan, uh, who is, of course, from Switzerland, uh, to, uh, to undertake um, that uh, presentation. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you very much, Russ. Distinguished Professor Arashima, the uh, pharmacist and pharmaceutical science scientist, dear colleagues, let me first thank the BPS, the Board of Pharmaceutical Science, and his chair, Professor Russ Makin, for organizing this event with the help, of course, of uh, our FIP team in the headquarters. I'm sure 
that the three scientists will never forget this moment when they, they had the opportunity to present their work in front of Professor Arashima and having the privilege to get his comments and questions. I am now very pleased and honored this year to present the Horst Matson Medal to Professor Hideyoshi Arashima from Japan. Professor Hideyoshi Arashima is, a, as we heard from uh, Professor McKinnon at the beginning of uh, this event, is a professor of pharmaceutics and the chair of laboratory of molecular design of uh, pharmaceutics, sorry, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Hokkaido University. He graduated in pharmacy at the University of Tokyo and undertook postdoctoral studies at Stanford University School of Medicine from 1987 to 1989 in a field of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics with a fellowship from Japanese Society of Promotion of Sciences. He became an associate professor at the University of Tokushima, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences in 1989, and was appointed as a full professor at Hokkaido University, Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences in 1999. He was also appointed as a professor of a newly built laboratory of innovative nanomedicines in 2009. His research was extending from uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics to drug delivery system called DDS from 1989. And he started new area of gene nucleic acid delivery from 1999. He developed a multifunctional envelope type nano device called MENT as an original system, which can control not only biodistribution, but also intracellular trafficking of these new materials as a drug. He published more than 420 original articles, 65 reviews, and 12 book chapters in English. He has more than 250 invited lectures in Japan as well as in the world. He submitted more than 75 patents based on his original DDS. His collaborative efforts include projects with many pharmaceutical companies in the AU, USA, and his own country, and he has been instrumental in the establishment of the Laboratory for Molecular Design of Pharmaceutics and the Laboratory of Innovative Nanomedicine, both in Japan. The Hosmetson Medal is not the first award he got. He received the Nagai Award from Japanese Society of Drug Delivery System in 2007, Distinguished Science Award from FIP in 2010, Fellow from Control Release Society in 2013, APSTJ Award and 19 Song Eum Med Form Award from Song Eum Academy Foundation in 2016. He also received Presidential Award from Hokkaido University in 2015, 16, and 19. He is a uh, an honorary director of Japanese Society of Drug Delivery System since 2019. He also serves as an associate editor of the Journal of Controlled Release and the Cancer Science during uh, 11 years, and as an executive editor of Advanced Drug Delivery Reviews for during eight years. He was a president of Academy of Pharmaceutical Science and Technology of Japan. He is also well known in FIP because he organized the first FIP APSTJ joint workshop on gene delivery in Sapporo in July 2006 as a co-chair of SIG for the pharmaceutical biotechnology. He also organized the Liposome Research Days Conference 2019 as a chair 
in September 2019 at Hokkaido University. It's now my honor to give to Professor Haideisho Arashami virtually because of the pandemic, this host medal, uh, uh, host Matson medal for his successful career and all the time he spent more than 30 years advancing the fields of nanomedicines, gene and nucleic acid therapy and drug delivery. Thank you very much for all your work. Thank you very much for advancing pharmaceutical science. And it's a great honor for FIP to give you this uh, medal. Help me clutching for the success of Professor Haidoisho Harashima. And you can do that in the chat if you like it. Thank you very much, Professor. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this award is uh, really uh, beyond my expectation since the, the all recipient of this award are very famous high impact professors whom I have known from when I was a student. So I'm very happy uh, to receive this award on behalf of my colleagues and students in our laboratory. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I really appreciate your kind introduction and this uh, medal. Thank you, in, in, in Ombacha, thank you very much. <laughs> so back to you, Ross. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, and it's now uh, my great pleasure to invite Professor uh, Harashima to uh, proceed with his host Madsen Award presentation. Thank you, Professor Harashima. Just can I just highlight just before you start, Professor Harashima, there is the opportunity, once again, I would reinforce to all of our uh, people participating in this um, ceremony, um, the opportunity to provide comments to Professor Harashima in the chat. And as I said earlier, we will process those comments uh, in the virtual uh, reception immediately after his presentation. Thank you, Professor Harashima. Thank you for your kind introduction, Ross. Uh, it is my great honor to present uh, this lecture as the recipient of the Hostmaster Medal 2021. I will do my best on behalf of all of my coworkers, as well as students who are in our laboratory and doing re research together. Let me start uh, with this title, Multifunctional Envelope Type Nano Device from controlled intracellular trafficking to clinical application for nanomedicine. Since 2020, we have been dealing with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Early on, we predict that vaccine, uh, that vaccine would be powerful weapons against this virus, but we were afraid that it would take at least three years for a new vaccine to be approved for clinical usage. As shown in this slide, the sequence of the COVID-19 virus was disclosed on January 11, 2020, and the first messenger RNA vaccine by Pfizer and BioNTech was approved on December 2nd in the UK and 11th in the USA. It was very surprising that an innovative mRNA vaccine against COVID-19 could be developed within one year. BioNTech 
a well-known venture company named this project as Project Lightspeed. They perform all the necessary processes, including preclinical studies, GMP production, clinical test phase one and two, global phase two and three, where 44,000 volunteers were recruited in collaboration with Pfizer. This speed is a miracle and deserve to be called light speed. How could it be possible to develop an innovative mRNA vaccine against COVID-19 within one year? Wiseman and Carrico have been studying mRNA vaccine, completely a new type of vaccine for a long time. They were searching a good DDS for delivering mRNA. On the other hand, Peter Callis, a leading scientist in DDS research, especially for nucleic acid such as siRNA and messenger RNA, is a genius who has made venture companies such as Inex and Tecmira. A breakthrough was achieved by collaboration with al Nairam, a venture company of siRNA, a new pH-responsive cationic lipid called MC3 was made and reported in 2012. This new lipid is a breakthrough technology in terms of transfecting siRNA in vivo. Based on MC3, Arnailam succeeded in producing the first siRNA medicine called Onpatro in 2018. Wiseman and Carico found that MC3 was a good DDS for delivering mRNA. She moved to BioNTech in 2013, and these three players start working efficiently. In 2015, the route of administration was examined, and in 2017, an mRNA vaccine for Zika virus, and in 2018, an influenza mRNA vaccine was developed. In 2018, BioNTech signed a contract for producing an influenza vaccine with Pfizer. The COVID-19 virus appeared in December 2019. BioNTech signed a contract for a COVID-19 mRNA vaccine with Pfizer in 2020. These processes indicate that BioNTech and Pfizer were in a position to start clinical testing for the influenza vaccine, but they changed the mRNA sequence from influenza to COVID-19 in 2020. They did not miss one chance in a million. Using an optimized pH-responsive cationic lipid, they succeeded in producing the first mRNA vaccine in December of 2020. It is generally accepted that viral vectors are much more efficient in transfection efficiency than non-viral vectors. In the case of COVID-19, both vectors were developed. AstraZeneca and Oxford University developed a vaccine using an adenovirus vector, and Pfizer and BioNTech used a non-viral vector for mRNA. The results of clinical trials indicated that the efficiency of the, the adenoviral vector was more than 70%, while the mRNA vaccine was more than 90% efficient. This is the first case that non-viral vectors are more effective than viral vectors due to the breakthrough technology such as MC3 and successors. 
the success of mRNA vaccine is worthy in terms of very quick, as well as a non-viral vector. Let me briefly introduce my research background. I studied pharmaceutical sciences at the Tokyo University, where I was involved in physiologically based pharmacokinetics and extended to pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic modeling in my PhD studies. I continued to study PKPD modeling at Stanford University. My goal was to understand drug action in our body from the standpoint of kinetics. I like mathematics and enjoyed PKPD modeling as shown in this slide. I was interested in different patterns of blood concentration, effect site concentration, and pharmacological effect. I was excited how to explain the difference of these time courses by creating new models based on receptor binding, etc. In 1989, I came back to Japan from Stanford University to Tokushima University as an associate professor. I changed my research subject from PKPD modeling to DDS, drug delivery system. This is a key point for me as a researcher. I found that controlled intracellular trafficking is the most exciting research subject for me. In 1999, I became a full professor at Hokkaido University where I established a new laboratory named as Laboratory for Molecular Design of Pharmaceutics. Since I wanted, desire to do molecular design of DDS like a chemist, not by trial and error approach. My interest shifted from how to understand to how to optimize drug action with a new DDS to control PK as well as intracellular PK. 10 years later, a new laboratory, Innovative Nanomedicine was created as a special research project of Hokkaido University to enhance clinical translation. My new goal is to translate new technologies born in our laboratories to clinics. Controlled intracellular trafficking was a completely new world in the 1990s. And I was so excited to imagine how to control vascular transport after being endocytosed. Molecular mechanisms were being found in the field of molecular cell biology, such as how the endosome can fuse each other, which led to Nobel Prize in 2013 for James Rossman et al. It was also unknown how to escape from endosome to reach nucleus. At the beginning, I was not so excited about applying these technologies to gene therapy, but my interest started to shift from basic science to nanomedicine. Let me discuss our research program in the Laboratory for Molecular Design of Pharmaceutics at Hokkaido University. Viruses, which evolved in nature, where their systems were optimized through millions of years, are the ultimate gene delivery system. We were inspired by viruses and started to develop non-viral vectors that can overcome all of the barriers from, the, from their administration to the site of action. Functional RNA or DNA are condensed with cation, which is covered with lipid envelope to protect from enzymatic degradation. Stability in the blood circulation, selective delivery to the target tissue, 
efficient internalization by the target cells, and the somal escape via membrane fusion, nuclear entry, transcription, and translation. To achieve such a goal, we need a packaging concept of our own called as programmed packaging. It is important to develop a program to overcome all these barriers inside our body, to design functional devices that realize these programs and to assign them three-dimensionally. It is also important to have a nanotechnology to assemble all devices into a nano size structure so that they can exert their function at the correct time and at the correct place. We refer to this system as a multifunctional envelope type nano device, abbreviated as a MEN. The first successful system was the RED MEN where octaarginine was introduced on the surface of nanoparticles in the form of a sterilated R8. R8 was found to have self-penetrating ability by a collaborator, Professor Shiro Futaki at Kyoto University. After collaboration with Professor Futaki, we found that transfection activity by the R8 men in orange was as high as that of adenovirus vector in green in in vitro conditions. These, these were exciting results since the non-viral vector that we made can compete with viral vectors. We submitted a patent and it was filed in eight countries with the great support of the Japanese government. We then moved from in vitro condition to in vivo condition. Positively charged nanoparticles had tendency to aggregate in the blood circulation and they were retained in the lung after intravenous injection. To solve this problem, we coated nanoparticles with polyethylene glycol, abbreviated PEG, to stabilize them in the blood circulation. The stability in blood circulation increased with increasing peg density, but transfection activity decreased dramatically, almost to the control level. This contradiction is referred to the peg dilemma. To solve the peg dilemma, we proposed a new strategy. A peg coating is important when circulating in the blood, but once the particle leaks into tumor tissue from blood circulation, peg is no longer needed. We introduce a peptide that can be cleaved by MMP, a protease secreted from tumor cells between the peg and lipid anchor. We refer to this mechanism, peg peptide men, a uh, dope abbreviated as PPD. Once the peg is dissociated, the naked uh, men can efficiently enter tumor cells and siRNA molecules can exert their function in the cytosol. We call this system a PPD men. After optimization of PPD men, we found that siRNA encapsulated in the PPD men induced the silencing of the target gene in tumor cells. We were excited about this and submitted a patent application. A new strategy appeared, a pH responsive cationic lipid or ionizable cationic lipid. This strategy was proposed by Peter Callis, who was mentioned in developing mRNA vaccine early on. In 2006, the first version 
leading DMA was reported in nature. The efficiency of this version was one to two milligram siRNA per kilogram of body weight, which is almost the same efficiency with our best system, such as PPD men or Arad Gara men. In 2010, they improved their system by optimizing lipid structures and dealing KC2 DMA achieved 0.02 milligram per kilogram, which exceeded two orders of magnitude from the original dealing DMA. A slight change in lipid structure can influence in vivo efficiency dramatically. It was unbelievable for me to change the activity so big by just adding or deleting one carbon atom in the linker. It seems to us that there is no such big space to be improved in our system. Therefore, we had to change our strategy to compete with Peter. Though TAP, a well-known cationic lipid, contains a quaternary amine group, which is always cationic. Though DAP contains a tertiary amine group, which can accept a proton depending on the surrounding pH. Therefore, it is called a pH responsive or ionizable cationic lipid. We designed YSK05, an original pH responsive lipid Yusuke Sato was a graduate student and learned how to synthesize such lipid from an assistant professor, Mamoru Hyodo, who is a chemist and joined our laboratory of innovative nanomedicine, which started 2009. This graph shows the pH profile of the surface charge of nanoparticles with different lipid. A conventional cationic men, such as DOTAP men, is always positively charged, while the positive charge of the DOTAP men or the YSK men are pH dependent. The pH at which 50% of the nanoparticles are positively charged is defined as the apparent pKa of the of nanoparticles. The YSK men develops a positive charge at pH between six and seven, corresponding to the pH in endosome. The in vivo silencing efficiency in the liver is evaluated by ED50, a 50% knockdown of a marker gene in the liver. And the YSK05 men improved the ED50 by 74 fold compared to that of the original men. Further improvement was obtained by using the YSK13 men, which resulted in the ED50 being enhanced by 104. We were convinced by this data that we chose the correct strategy. The YSK men released the surface peg rapidly in the blood circulation and blood Apolipoprotein E were bound to the surface of the YSK men, which can be recognized by the LDL receptors on hepatocytes and were internalized efficiently. The YSK zerified lipid is protonated due to the decreased pH in endosome. Fusion between nanoparticle and endosomal membrane are enhanced to release siRNA into cytosol, which exert gene silencing. The surface peg was introduced just to provide stability before administration and not to give a long circulation time in blood when we target the liver. The YSK MEND was successfully applied to cure hepatitis C or B virus infected mice model. Dr. Kohara at the Tokyo Metropolitan Institute was looking for a good DDS for hepatocyte 
to test their siRNA for curing a HCV model mouse, a mouse model. The siRNA encapsulated in the YSK05 men was found to cure this HCV mouse model, which was a first success for him as well as for us. We further challenged by HBV, HBV, which is a DNA virus and difficult to, to cure. The YSK05 men failed to be a cure. We then shifted to a YSK13 men, which is improved and more efficient than the YSK05 men. It was successful in curing the HBV mouse model. We were very happy with these results and submitted patents for YSK05 or 13. Unfortunately, we had to abandon these patents since it was found later that these structures overlapped with a patent held by a certain big pharma. We recognize that it is important to have a chemical library to functional lipid to find the best efficiency. We constructed a lipid library based on YSK12C4 as a benchmark. We changed the structure of the hydrophilic head groups, which principally determine the PKA, and hydrophobic lipid tails, which principally determine endosomal escape efficiency. As predicted, hydrophilic head groups caused a significant change in the PKA of nanoparticles. And there was the optimum PKA at around 6.5 in the gene silencing of hepatocyte in vivo. As a, as a result of the screening of in vivo gene silencing in hepatocytes, we found that CL4H6 could induce silencing at a dose of 0 0.0025 milligram per kilogram, which is more efficient than that of MC3. The green line represents YSK05 lipid nanoparticle, abbreviated as LNP. The blue line represents YSK13 LNP. The pink line represents MC3 LNP. Uh, sorry, black line represents MC3 LNP, and the pink line represents CL4 H6 LNP. The efficiency of CL4H LNP is improved by 400 fold from the original Arwet Gala men. As shown in the lipid structure, CL4H6 con contains ester bond. Safety is an important issue when we consider clinical application. In the case of YSK05 or 13, they were retained in the liver and spleen for a few days, while CL4H6 disappeared rapidly from the liver and spleen. In a toxicity evaluation study where high dose was administered, the AST or ALT value for CL4H6 LNP decreased from high value to normal values which is likely due to the biodegradability of CL4H6 in the liver and spleen. CL4H6 LNP can be used to deliver mRNA. LNPs are made by iLIMP, which, which is our original microfluidics device developed by Professor Manabu Tokeshi at the School of Engineering. The LNP formulation was optimized for transfection activity in the liver using design of experiment. The optimized B13 LNP can induce high levels of human hypoprotein in the blood. In case of M-cherry expression in the liver, 
B13 was found to be superior to MC3. The CL4H6LNP can also be applied to CRISPR-Cas ribonucleoprotein, abbreviated as RNP. RNP was loaded into LNP using microfluidics, where special attention should be paid so as not to inactivate the RNP. The optimized RNP LNP showed a more than 95% knockdown at the tenfold lower concentrations reported so far. Base substitution can also be induced at more than 20% from EGFP to BFP. These LNP studies were led by assistant professor Yusuke Sato. Let's move to the next topic, nanocancer immunotherapy. BCG vaccine are well known for tuberculosis. Live BCG are widely used for the treatment of bladder cancer. However, live BCG cannot be administered intravenously due to infections. It was very difficult to de develop a pharmaceutical formulation since CWS, the cell wall skeleton, is insoluble in both water and hydrophobic solvents. In collaboration with Japan BCG company, we succeeded in developing lipid nanoparticles encapsulating compacted CWS molecule. After intravenous administration of CWS LNP, they were taken up by spleen cells such as dendritic cell and B cell. As a result, significant activation of cytotoxic T lymphocyte was observed, which resulted to induce anti-tumor activity. This result indicates the possibility of CWS LNP to cure other types of cancer than bladder cancer. It is well known that Immune cells such as T cell, monocyte, dendritic cells are difficult to be transfected. Commercially available RNAi max cannot induce enough silencing. However, YSK12 men can deliver siRNA efficiently to these type of human immune cells and induce significant silencing. This system, system can be applied to human primary CD4 plus T cells as shown below. This is a collaboration with Faculty of Medicine and Institute of Genetic Medicine of Hokkaido University. These results indicate applicability of this technology for the next generation of cancer immunotherapy. Sting, stimulator of interferon genes, was found to be an intracellular sensor against DNA of viruses, mycobacteria, etc., and plays an important role as innate immunity by inducing type 1 interferon. Since it is difficult for sting agonists to enter into cells due to their hydrophilicity, we developed a sting LNP, which can deliver sting agonists to the cytosol of immune cells, where they, they are recognized by sting system. Interestingly, we found that sting LNP can induce not only an antigen-specific anti-tumor effect, but also an antigen non-specific anti-tumor effect. These uh, nano-cancer immunotherapy studies were led by assistant professor Takashi Nakamura. Let's move to mitochondrial targeting. The mitoporta is a membrane fusion-based nanodevice to mitochondria. 
Mitochondria are an important target organelle in gene therapy, but in 2000, there was almost no such delivery system available. We started developing a delivery system to mitochondria and succeeded in developing a mite portal, which can deliver encapsulated materials via membrane fusion manner. Therefore, mite portal can deliver many kinds of drugs, such as common drugs, proteins, and nucleic acids. We screen various lipid compositions for fusion activity with mitochondrial membranes using isolated mitochondria. It was found that dope, RA, and sphingomyelin or phosphatic acid are important components for a mite porter. Mitochondria contains mutant RNA, some of which are the cause of mitochondrial disease, such as MELAS, Elhorn, Lee syndrome, etc. Here is a recent study on ribosomal RNA delivery to mitochondria. Our strategy is to deliver normal ribosomal RNA with a mite porter to patient cells with a mitochondrial mutation to dilute the mutant RNA. Mutation rate was decreased from 92% to 50%. The rate of oxygen consumption increased to almost double compared to the non-treatment level. This is a case for ribosomal RNA, and the mitoporter can be applicable for transfer RNA and messenger RNA. The 7C project is an innovation for mitochondrial therapy, and we joined this project with the mitoporter technology. In 2018, Luca Science, a bio-venture company, was founded. Yuma Yamada and myself served as scientific advisors to Luca Science. They also established a new laboratory, BioDDS Translational Laboratory, in the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Hokkaido University. Associate Professor Yuma Yamada is the chair of this laboratory. Clinical translation are uh, proceeded by creating a global network. Mitochondrial delivery studies are led by Associate Professor Yuma Yamada. This slide shows recent clinical application of nucleic acid or gene therapy. Spinraza in 2016, antisense drug. Kimuria in 2017, the first gene therapy in the USA. Onpatro in 2018, the first siRNA nanomedicine, MC3. Zorgensma 2019, gene therapy using AAB9. mRNA vaccine against COVID-19 in 2020, ionizable lipids. The rapid emergence of inno innovative medicine indicated a new era of nucleic acid or gene therapy. Creating a venture company to translate new technologies to clinics is now widely used. Unfortunately, in Japan, it was difficult to succeed by following this route so far. Why difficult in Japan? There is not enough money for venture companies in Japan, one to 100 compared to USA. There is not a good circumstance for venture company in Japan like a Silicon Valley in USA. Brilliant students do not choose a venture company. They prefer big companies, which is opposite in USA. It was difficult for me to attract good students to a venture company for clinical translation in Hokkaido University. Therefore, I had to take a different way. Fortunately, I. I could make another laboratory, Innovative Nanomedicine, for clinical translation in 2009. Hokkaido University project, Vascular Targeted Nanomedicine, 
is the key strategy for our clinical translation. Let me show Hokkaido University model. Seeds are continuously generated in our laboratories in molecular design of pharmaceutics and in innovative nanomedicine. A good seed is protected as a patent of Hokkaido University with strong support of our patent office. Professor Atsushi Homa and Dr. Yuichiro Onodera are managing our patents at each stage. Without their support, it seems very difficult to move forward clinical translation. Strong leakage have been made in Hokkaido University, such as Professor Tokeshi, microfluidics in engineering, Professor Hida, tumor vascular biology in dental medicine, Professor Toshifumi Sato, polymer library in engineering, etc. Since we are developing DDS, it is important to collaborate with venture companies with cutting edge technology, such as Luca Science for mitochondrial therapy, Lilac Pharma, microfluidic device, venture company C, a genome editing, etc. Now we are ready to link with material companies, pharmaceutical companies for the in industrialization of nanomedicine. In this model, academic researchers are always at the center of each project and we can pursue them in parallel. In 1848, gold was found in California and fortune seekers rushed in. Later, it was found that who made a fortune were not those who sold gold, but who sold levies or sh shovels. Now, the time of RNA medicine has come. Breakthrough DDS technologies are essential for nucleic acid medicine or gene therapy, as levies or shovels were essential for gold seekers. Who is the next? I would like to express my sincere appreciation to Professor Tsuneji Nagai for his endless encouragement and a powerful support for receiving this hour. I wish to express my special thanks to Professor Patrick Kuva for his continuous encouragement for this hour. I would like to thank Professor Yuichi Sugiyama who trained me when I was a graduate student at Tokyo University and has inspired me a clear goal as a scientist. I thank Professor Manabu Hanano, Professor Hiroshi Kiwada, Professor Kazunori Kataoka, who encouraged me continuously when I was in Tokyo, Tokushima, and Hokkaido, respectively. I express my special thanks to young faculty members, Yuma Yamada, Takashi Nakamura, and Yusuke Sato, who all graduated from our laboratory and became faculty members and are now working together in our laboratory. I would also express my deep thanks to all the faculty members who studied together in our laboratories and who are now involved in their own research. I would like to thank all the eminent professors for their fruitful collaboration in the right and many PhD students who graduated from our laboratory in the left. I'm sorry that I could not show all the students due to the limited space and time. Thank you for your kind attention. Um, thank you very much, Professor Harashima for a um, really what was a tour de force of, uh, of, of drug delivery, the development of drug delivery systems, which are now obviously impacting the, um, the world community in such a uh, incredible way through the, uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, it's a remarkable body of work. Um, and uh, once again, I would just um, re-emphasize just how 
deserving you are of FIP's highest pharmaceutical science honor, the host medicine medal. Uh, congratulations to you. Um, to, to finish our ceremony, we, we just wanted to highlight that we have been collecting um, our congratulation messages that have been flowing through through the evening. Um, and we will save those for you and we will provide those to you. Um, we have congratulation messages from, uh, from many of your colleagues. We also have congratulation messages from key members of the FIP um, Board of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Executive Council and, uh, and many others. And as I said, we will be collecting those. So I would just like to ask everybody who is on the uh, webinar to uh, express their uh, gratitude to you for such a wonderful presentation and once again to congratulate you for your award. Congratulations, Professor Hiroshima. Thank you very much. I really appreciate for this occasion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will uh, wrap up uh, this evening's webinar um, by uh, just highlighting um, the fact that we are in September and I just wanted to highlight that the 25th of September is World Pharmacist Day. Uh, Paula, I think you have a slide that you can show us for that. Um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has obviously highlighted just how connected we are across our borders and emphasised the value of sol solidarity amongst the pharmacy profession. Uh, for those of you who are pharmacists, uh, I would ask you to to seek out the uh, World Pharmacist Day at the FIP websites. Uh, and in particular, there is the capacity to, um, to basically uh, generate a, um, a slide which uh, demonstrates that your support for World Pharmacist Day and something you can use on various social media. So as I said, if you are a pharmacist, please be uh, alert to that. I would like to finish this evening by uh, once again, thanking our, um, our wonderful recipient of the uh, Host Madsen Medal, Professor Hiroshima. Uh, and I would also like to thank our three young speakers for their involvement in this evening's event. I think this evening was quite a unique event, a unique format for a presentation such as this, given the, uh, the pandemic. Um, I think it was a wonderful opportunity for the three of you to uh, obviously uh, show the world your work, but also get the feedback from someone of the caliber of Professor Hiroshima. Um, thank you also to the FIP head office staff for their support in, uh, in preparing tonight's webinar. Um, and I would just say to everybody, uh, again, congratulations, Professor Hiroshima. Thank you for your involvement, everybody. Uh, good night. Good morning, good evening, wherever you be in the world. Uh, thank you for your involvement in what I think was a wonderful event. So thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.